the stack model is the main page of the spreadsheet. And the way this works, sort of like the other spreadsheets that I've shown you up in the upper left corner, we have a block of input parameters and calculated values. Uh, in this case, purple are things that we're setting and green are things that are calculated outputs. Right away, I'm making some assumptions. So one of them is that all the cells in the stack behave the same way and they're all in the same temperature gradients and everything's the same. So we have translational symmetry up and down the stack, every cell behaves the same. Um, I'm also making another assumption is that I have translational symmetry in the direction perpendicular to flow. So as I look at the flow this way, there's no variation into or out of the plane of the page. I have some width into the depth of my view that is the width of the cell. And it's the same everywhere along that width. Uh, and that's one of the inputs is what that width is. And then the other thing that's specified here is the fuel flow. This is in moles per second uh, for one cell. So, so everything here, unlike the other one, is extensive. So we're looking here at a particular cell, which has a particular width, in this case, 11 centimeters. And I'm flowing a particular amount of fuel across it. I have not specified the length of the cell yet. And I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing, we're specifying the inlet and outlet temperatures, just like we did before for the whole stack. And we're specifying the fuel utilization and the pressure and the cell voltage. So those are all inputs. With that information, we already know things like the power per cell and the total current that must be flowing because we know how much fuel we're putting in and we know how much we're burning. We know what the cell voltage is. So we can calculate the total power and current that are flowing through the stack. The red here, this is the air to fuel ratio. Uh, the reason it's, it's red is to remind us this is actually coming from our flow sheet model where we had a black box solid oxide fuel cell putting in air at a certain temperature, in this case, 500 degrees. The exhaust will come out at 700 degrees. And then we calculated what airflow we would need at a certain voltage and a certain utilization in order to maintain constant temperature in the stack at steady state. Uh, what I've added is this overall stack balance section right here, uh, which is basically just a repeat of what we're doing in the flow sheet model. And so again, you, you're going to use goal seek basically to adjust the airflow. And I can force this cell to zero by adjusting the air to fuel ratio. It's written in terms of the air to fuel ratio because um, I want to be able to separately manipulate the air, the fuel flow while keeping the airflow ratio the same. And so the balance is maintained. So boop, boop, boop. So I can zero out that energy balance. And what that does is it ensures that the airflow that's going into my differential balances is consistent with the overall energy balance. A couple other things that are important is um, thermal conduction. So this model is fairly crude in how it treats that, but basically we have a gas phase region where the gases are flowing and they're in contact with solid materials which comprise the cell and the interconnects that interconnect the different cells. Those are made of solids, usually stainless steel these days or some variant of stainless steel. That stainless steel has a certain thermal conductivity. And so when we generate thermal energy, that stainless steel helps distribute that thermal energy uh, around in the stack, in this case, laterally, as long as in the direction of flow, we generate heat, that heat then spreads through the metal. Um, there are a number of ceramic, electronically conductive ceramics that people have used for solid oxide fuel cell interconnects. They have much lower thermal conductivity, um, which tends to lead to larger temperature gradients. And then we have a heat transfer coefficient. This governs the transfer of heat between the gas and the solid. So if the gas is hotter than the solid, we expect heat to flow from the gas to the solid and vice versa. One of the things we'll talk about in a couple of weeks also is the fluid mechanics in these types of systems. The channels are all really small. We're at low pressure and high temperature where the gas densities are low. So all the flows tend to be laminar. And because of that laminar flow, um, we can usually predict the heat transfer coefficient fairly accurately. And then here I'm just transferring over cell characteristics that I have fit to my data on the other spreadsheet and I'm just transferring them over here so I can use them here. There's also some thermodynamic data. So we're gonna be doing energy balances along the slices of our stack. And so we need to know the enthalpies. And we also need to calculate um, open circuit voltages which require the free energy. So we have both enthalpy and Gibbs free energy. 
At this point, I'm saying the total current must be blah, blah, blah. How I distribute that current is currently unknown. And how much area we need to allow that much current to flow is also unknown. And that's why I'm not specifying a cell length. That's what's going to try. That's what we're going to try to calculate. This problem is already solved. So I'm just going to show you the results and then I'll show you how, how we get to that. So here's a, a plot of position um, along the length of flow. And then on this axis is temperature. Um, and there's a gas and a solid. So the gas is in turquoise. The solid is dark blue. And this is showing as we go, so it's showing that we are obeying our, our boundary conditions. So we said the inlet is at 500 degrees. We said the outlet is 700 degrees. That's what, I, that's what my inputs were. And you can see that it has solved for the temperature profile in between. And it is also solved for the temperature of the solid along the flow channel. And you can see they're not the same. It looks like toward the leading edge of the stack, we have hotter metal surfaces than the gas. So the gas is colder. The metal is hotter. And then as we leave, we go out the other end. It's the other way around. The gases are hotter and the metal is a bit cooler. I think this is demonstrating the effect of the solid as a heat distribution device, basically. Um, when things come in, they're at their coldest. The stack is generating thermal energy. It's spreading left and right along the stack. And as, it, as, the, as the heat conducts to the left, then it leaves the metal surfaces near the leading edge of the stack hotter than the gas is coming in and some heat flows from solid to gas. And then likewise at the tail end, um, the same thing is happening. Gases are getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. They finally leave at 700 degrees. That's the hottest place. And so some of the thermal energy is transferring from the gas to the solid at that point and being redistributed. And then here's what the utilization looks like as a function of position. Utilization goes from zero in this case up to 85% because I put in an 85% fuel utilization. And you'll notice the utilization gets faster and faster as we get toward the end of the stack. But why is that? Well, if you look down at the current density, you can see it starts out fairly low because that's where the cells are cold. And then as things get hotter, the current can pass faster at the same voltage and that continues to rise. So this is sort of one of the things we saw in that sort of qualitative view of this, where as you look along the flow channel and temperature goes up, that tends to increase the current density. And that's what we're seeing. It doesn't keep going up though, it eventually starts to plateau. And so we're seeing a little bit of the effect of the depletion of the fuel. Eventually the driving force for current density drops off a little bit because the fuel gets depleted. And then we see this trend doesn't continue even though it's getting hotter, current density is actually flattening out. So this overall effect is that we're getting higher, much higher currents toward the end of the stack, lower currents at the beginning, leading edge of the stack. And the distance that we're traveling to get to 85% utilization is about 15 centimeters. That's actually an output of this calculation is what length of cell would we need to reach that level of utilization? That's basically answering this question. So how does it do it? So that's what this part over here is. This index is an indica is, indicates the relative position. The index zero means the leading edge and index 20 is the end of the stack. And those numbers are fixed. So what I've basically done is I've taken the cell, which is whatever length, I don't know yet, and I've cut it into 20 pieces. I'm gonna do individual material and energy balances on each of those little pieces. One thing you'll notice is that the position along the cell, this is a calculated quantity. I start out at zero, where index zero is, and it grows up to 15 centimeters. So I'm not taking this and slicing it into 20 equal pieces of length. And the reason is you don't yet know the current density at each of those slices. So what this does instead is it says, okay, I'm gonna break it into 20 pieces, but each piece, instead of being equal width, instead, each piece will have a prescribed amount of utilization. So piece one, I'm going to utilize some of the fuel and I specify that. Piece number two is going to burn a little bit more fuel and we'll specify that and so forth. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. One is just say linear. I'm going from zero to 85% utilization. I just take 85% divide by 20 and each one has the same amount of utilization. That does lead to some numerical inaccuracies because you're going to have a lot of current in some cells and, and much less in others. So instead, it uses a nonlinear progression of utilization as we go along. And that is over here. 
So I set up a scale that goes from zero to one. Zero corresponds to no utilization. One corresponds to the maximum utilization. And then what it does is it calculates as a function of that scale, a portion of the exiting utilization. So the, uh, the utilization at the start is zero. Util utilization coming out is 85%. And it's calculating a curve. Um, if you want to know the details of what that curve shape is, it's down here. It's basically a, a rising curve that looks like this to kind of match what, the, what we think the current density is going to look like. The one parameter is this k constant. It should be some integer number. If you make it close to zero, that means linear progression. If you make it something bigger, then it's more curved. There's no theory behind this. It is just a convenience and a way of kind of minimizing the number of elements that we need to use in order to calculate this with reasonable accuracy. By the time we're done with that, it creates a predefined list of utilization. So we've got these 20 subcells, and we're saying that each one is consuming a certain amount of fuel. And then what it does along here is it calculates the cumulative extent of reaction. This is expressing that, that oxidation reaction in moles per second. Once we know the local extent, I know what the voltage is because we're specifying that. I can calculate based on the local extent what the work would have to be. So I now know for each of my 20 elements how much electrical power each one is generating. I can add that up and that gives me the total amount of work. And that of course should match the amount that we've already decided we're gonna have based on the utilization and cell voltage. So once we know that, we now know what is flowing through the stack. We know what's entering each cell. We know how much fuel we're using up. We know how much oxygen we're using up and how much water we're producing. So the material balance sort of just falls into place once we've prescribed what each of these individual subcells is doing. The part that's still missing is what the temperature is. So to proceed, we make a guess. And that's what these are over here in blue. So if you're doing this later, um, this is showing our guess temperatures. So the incoming temperature is 500. That's black because that's specified. The outgoing temperature is 700. That I also marked black because that's not going to be adjusted either. But then in between, we have guess temperatures. And then we're going to solve. Solver has already solved this problem. So it's adjusted these up and down to solve the energy balances. Right now though, I am going to give it the wrong numbers. I just put in a guess that it's gonna linearly vary with this scale of utilization. And the solid is conductive, so we would expect it to be flatter. So once I've guessed the temperature, we can then proceed with all of the other stuff that we're used to doing. We can calculate enthalpy of everything because enthalpy depends on temperature. So same formula as we've used before when we do an energy balance on a stack. You've got incoming enthalpies for hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and water. We also calculate the entropy of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and water. So that allows us to calculate G. We can calculate a delta G zero for the hydrogen oxidation reaction. That's important when we go to calculate a reversible voltage. We've already decided how much each little subcell is going to use up. So we can go ahead and solve all the material balances. That's what this is looking at. So we have a certain amount of nitrogen hydrogen going in. And then each one is being I'm consuming hydrogen by a certain amount that's given by the amount of utilization on, on that subcell. That in turn is making water. So water goes up along the flow channel. The total amount of moles is the sum of those two. And you notice it's constant. It's constant because each hydrogen makes a water. So it's a one-to-one -one exchange and one molecule for the other in the anode compartment. And then we can calculate the mole fractions. The mole fractions we need because the current density depends on the mole fractions in the gas. So does the reversible potential. And then we're using that current density at each, at each element of utilization to calculate the cell width that you need or the cell area that you would need to accomplish that. And that's what we're adding up back over here. So we're getting a delta Y for every single element and then adding that up to get the total distance. Um, so that's what shows it shown, shown in these plots. And then we come over here. Um, this is starting to look a little bit like an enthalpy table. Basically, we're looking at, we've calculated all the enthalpies. We know the flow rates. We can calculate N, the molar flow rate times the enthalpy. So this is N dot H N for each cell. And it's a function of position because whatever comes in that is changing as a result of work 
or heat flows, and then we have a certain amount of uh, enthalpy coming out. As the gas leaves and goes to the next subcell, it carries with it a certain amount of thermal energy given by n dot h. That n dot h, which we're calculating, just becomes the n dot h for the next cell down. So n dot h out for this cell is n dot h in for the next cell. Then we have heat in and out. This is the heat flux from the solid to the gas. And then we have a heat flux, which is the lateral heat flux. What that is basically looking at is what is the temperature difference in the solid from place to place as we go from cell to cell? The temperature varies. In this case, the dark blue curve, the temperature goes up. And so at each point in space, uh, I'm going to be transferring heat along that temperature gradient given by the conductivity of the metal. So if it's hotter over here and cooler over here, I can calculate how much heat flows from one to the next. And it's done very crudely. I'm just taking take the conductivity times the distance. And the distance I'm taking to be half the width of this element plus half the width of that element to give you the total distance. That distance is being calculated as an output and then fed back in. So we've got n dot h in, n dot h out. We've got heat flows and we have electrical work. And we add all that stuff together. And it's not going to be zero because our temperature guess was wrong. And that's what this is showing. These two columns right here, this is the accumulation of thermal energy in each element. So I'm looking at both the solid and the gas. So it's going to get hotter or it's going to get colder. And this right here becomes the objective function. So I'm going to look at these accumulation rates, take the square of them, and add them together. And so this quantity, we want to be zero. If it goes to zero, then the energy balance will be obeyed. So I take all of these, add them up, and I get one number. That one number, it should be zero. Now I have, I have a means to do, to do this with solver. Let's give this to solver and say, I want this cell, which is some, some of all these accumulation rates, to go to zero. And I'm going to ask it to adjust all of those temperatures simultaneously to make that happen. So I'm going to say, I want this to go to a minimum, and I'm adjusting all the intermediate temperatures. That includes everything between the 500 and 70 de 700 degree boundary conditions. It also includes all the solid temperatures for each of the sub elements. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. I don't know if you guys can read that at the lower left corner, but right now the objective cell 600, 500, 300, 100, 38, 26, 20, 17, 15. That's a good sign when it's going down. 12, 9, 5. Okay, so I got it down to 1 from starting at 3,000. So that's what our solution ends up looking like. So it's telling us that the, the gas actually rises in temperature pretty quickly, right at the bleeding edge. And this agrees pretty well with what people have reported in the literature or in also using finite element modeling, that if you have a highly massive solid material, that's most of the thermal mass in the system, it has some thermal conductivity in it, you generate all this thermal energy, and you dump it into the metal, it tends to spread it all over the place. And um, that means the whole stack is going to get pretty hot. The gas is coming right in at the leading edge. They're going to really quickly just beep, get heated up to whatever is the te local temperature of the metal and come largely to thermal equilibrium with it. So if you look after about three centimeters, the, the solid and the gas kind of just vary together. And the only place they split apart again is toward the end of the stack where the opposite thing happens. The gases are leaving hotter and hotter and we're pulling thermal energy out of that gas and conducting it away from the, where the most current density is. So as the current density gets to its maximum, generating all this thermal energy in the gas, and that's being redistributed. So that's kind of the mechanics of this.